intend to come to this. I have not, uh, uh, I don't know it has. But anyways, what, what, what we know is that, yes. that steroids might be good for, mm -hmm. for, for ARDS, but we fear yes. the side effects. Can you, can, can you please? Mm. Do you hear him, guys? Nisa, please unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so um, we also know that uh, from 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 pharmacology that. Um, Different steroids perform differently when given to the patient. For example, we know that, uh, sorry, just, uh, we know that dexamethasone um, is equivalent to almost more than 20 milligrams. Four milligrams of dexamethasone is equivalent to almost 20 milligrams of prednisolone. We also know that dexamethasone does not have or has a relatively minimal mineral corticoid activity. We know that prednisolone has some uh, mineral corticoid activity, also methyl prednisolone. So these are the drugs that will be you will find in, in literature um, regarding uh, steroid and PRPS. Uh, in this review, Young and Marsh uh, raised many concerns with, um, with, with using uh, steroids in critically ill patients. Among those concerns were hyperglycemia, um, imbalance in, in, in fluid uh, pharmacokinetics, so hypernatremia and fluid retention, um, the issue of immunosuppression that comes with uh, steroids. We know that steroids have an effect in stabilizing lysosomes. We know that they um, stabilize the endothelium and prevent uh, seepage of glucose, thus minimizing the release of cytokines. We know that they, they increase phospholipase A2, so they inhibit leukotrienes, cytokines, prostaglandins, and so forth. So minimizing basically an immune response. We also know that uh, there, there could be side effects that, uh, that, that come with using uh, corticosteroids. Um, we are also worried about ICU acquired uh, weakness with use of, 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 of prolonged uh, steroids in ICU. But let's just see <clears throat> When we, when we talk about adrenal cortical suppression, which I think is one of the most um, uh, um, serious side effects, because if you have this, patients will die, they will go into shock. Um, this is a meta-analysis that looked at uh, 75 um, articles. So these articles, 35 of them were, were randomized controlled trials and uh, the rest were observational studies. So on the observational studies, they used cohorts and, um, and um, uh, cross-sectional studies. So what we can see here, they tried to um, compare the, the route of administration. That is, if you were using oral steroids, what were your chances of getting adrenocortical suppression? Right? So they found that most people that were using oral steroids had a higher incidence or relative of absolute risk of, um, of uh, adrenocortical suppression. And those that were using intraarticular steroids as well as multiple forms of, 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 of steroids. So you find that these patients are mostly, um, the oral ones, were mostly asthma patients that were taking oral prednisone. So they then looked at the duration of administration. So how long does it take when you're using steroids for you to get adrenocortical suppression? So um, they looked at short term. Short term was less than a month. 
medium term would be a month to a year, and long term would be a year. So they found that um, you mostly like at, likely to get adrenocortical suppression if you were losing steroids for, 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 for more than a year. This was um, without looking at the, at, at the dose of the drug, just the duration of the drug. So also if you've been using the drugs for a little more of more than a month, um, you, 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 you got some, 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 some risk which was around 11. Right. And then they then stratified uh, their data according to uh, low dose, medium dose, and high dose. So this would be an equivalent of, low dose would be an equivalent of less than 10 milligrams prednisone, and uh, medium dose would be 10 to 20, and high dose would be more than 20. You can see that from 10 to 20, you start getting some adrenocortical suppression. Above 20, you definitely get adrenocortical suppression. If you compare this, or you, you, you compare this to dexamethasone, you find that uh, 20 milligrams, like I showed you earlier on, 20 milligrams of uh, dexamethasone is equivalent to, I mean, of prednisone is equivalent to dexamethasone. So even four milligrams of dexamethasone used for more than a month can cause um, adrenocortical suppression. So this raises real concerns. But we know that if we use steroids for less than a month, we don't expect that we'll get um, um, side effect, um, adrenocortical um, uh, suppression. <clears throat> they then went further on and analyzed data on patients that had stopped now uh, the, the steroid therapy. They looked after a month, so short term would be those that took steroids for less than a month. So after four weeks, they looked at their cortisol levels, they wondered how were they doing in terms of adrenocortical uh, suppression. So you can see even after four weeks of using just one month of, uh, less than one month of corticosteroid, you still get some adrenocortical suppression. When you use it for long term, which means um, long term to medium, so one month to a year, after six months, you still have some adrenocortical suppression. So use of steroid is not without, um, without risk. So by now you might be asking yourself, is, is, is the use of, 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 of uh, glucocorticoids justified in, 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 in critical pain, or is it unfairly judged? So in this editorial that you, well, it, this is a letter to the editor. This is in response to what the Society of Critical Care Medicine in, in unison with the European Critical Care Society did. So they, they, they produced guidelines on um, management or approach to corticosteroid in use at cortical suppression or insufficiency. So here, this, 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 this author, Gianfranco Meduri, how he, he, he argues here, he says that um, the steroids that were used mostly in, 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 the, in literature, in old literature, were, were in high dose. So people used high doses of methylprednisolone. They would use doses of uh, a thousand over a day and then go to an infusion of two milligrams per kg over a day for, for maybe what a month. So of course that is bound to cause adrenocortical suppression and that is bound to cause uh, side effects. He also mentioned an experimental study in rats where rats were exposed to 3 milligrams, 30 milligrams, and 180 milligrams of methylprednisolone. So he found that patients that were exposed to high doses of methylprednisolone uh, did well in the first seven days. That is, they improved in terms of um, uh, the bronchial alveolar lavage, the inf um, inflammatory markers, and histology. But after seven days, they tended to deteriorate. Uh, they tended to, to, to die as well. Those that were given low doses of steroids tended to have a lower 
um, and, 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 and gradual improvement, but at the end did much better. So the critical care society, because of um, not being sure of um, the use of steroids in, in ARDS and their outcome in ICU, so to review um, studies, so they did a pulled meta-analysis. So a pulled meta-analysis would include RCTs and observational studies like the previous one that I mentioned. So on this pulled uh, uh, meta-analysis, they then looked at individual patient data meta-analysis. So they had four RCTs that were assessed as an individual patient data meta-analysis. And then they had four, about five, that were analyzed as a group. Um, sort of a cluster form of meta-analysis. But from this, they first uh, <clears throat> analyzed um, extubation um, when patients were given methylprednisolone or when patients were, given, were not given methylprednisolone. From this graph, we can see the patients that died before extubation were much lesser when you give steroids. The patient that achieved um, successful extubation were much higher with steroids. Patients that were alive and did not uh, achieve extubation were higher when you did not use steroids. Discharge from ICU alive showed that patients on steroids were most likely to leave the ICU alive. So from this, <clears throat> they then went on further to put this on a, on a forest plot, they assess the mortality now um, of use with use of, of corticosteroids. So from this, we can see, um, I'll just go to the summary. From the summary, you see that uh, mortality, um, the risk ratio favors use of glucocorticoids. Okay? So these are all the studies they use. This is a uh, this is, will be the individual patient data meta-analysis. This will be the group meta-analysis. And then this will be the results for all these studies. So you see that uh, the risk ratio is 0 0.6. It's, it's between confidence intervals that are significant, that is less than one. There's no one in between the, the confidence intervals. But you can see that there is some um, heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity about, well, I would say mild heterogeneity. So this gives us, this, this, this gave people a new thought and um, people wanted to, 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 to review this information and they looked at it as a positive information and that steroid should actually be, be used more in, 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 in ICU. And then this gave rise to, to, to the critical care societies, both the international and the European, advising that uh, low dose methylprednisolone should be used in ARDS patients, right? <clears throat> but with conditions. Okay. So what they also found was that you tended to have hyperglycemia when you used steroids over the first 36 hours. But this hyperglycemia did not cause any significant uh, impact on mortality. They then looked at um, infection rate, they looked at bleeding, they looked at uh, muscular um, myopathies. They, saw, they found no difference with steroids or non-steroids. So this is the... Uh, um, um, regimen that they used. They gave um, a bolus at, at, at the beginning. So the bolus would be one milligrams per kg. All right. Um, and then they gave infusion over 28 days. All right. The infusion will be 240 mils, right, of, of one mil per kg. Then they tapered it down over days of the over the 28 days, and then they stopped it. They said they did this because they noticed that if you stopped it abruptly without tapering the steroids, there was a reconstitution of the inflammation. So 
the ARDS came back and there was increased chances of re-extubation. All right, so before this, um, the, after this, a lot of trials that we did, um, were done, but these trials that were done um, did not have enrichment uh, strategies. Enrichment strategies are strategies that um, increase predicting um, mortality and decreasing heterogeneity within studies. And before this study that I'm showing you right now, um, there had been a lot of negative trials in critical care with regards to ARDS and corticosteroids. Negative trials are trials that don't find any difference in, in, in the outcome that is being studied. So this was because um, there was poor baseline characteristics. They were, um, the outcome measures were wrong. They would look at all-cause mortality without considering that there are many things that contribute to all-cause mortality. Uh, VEB, uh, the patient in, in ACU, um, positive uh, water balance, all of those things. So this study sort of sought to uh, minimize all of those. So they, they wanted to look at patients with ARDS. So the ARDS had to meet the Berlin criteria. And this type of ARDS had to be moderate or severe because when they did their enrichment studies, they found that moderate to severe um, ARDS, you were more likely to, to pick up um, 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 uh, effect of, 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 of the therapy than if you'd use um, patients that were mild. And that when you used moderate to severe, you, get, you tend to get sicker patients that you most likely going to see the effect of therapy more than if you use less sicker patients. So in their study, they included 200, almost 277 patients. They assigned 139 to dexamethasone and 138 to the control group. They analyzed, they did their analysis with intention to treat. Um, they excluded all patients with uh, immunosuppression on, on previous corticosteroids or, only, or any um, uh, chronic, uh, chronic diseases that were terminal. Uh, they also excluded patients that were pregnant and lactating and brain dead. And they first, this is how they randomized their patients first. So patient had to be first uh, ventilated with uh, lung protective strategies, according to the ARDS network, for over 24 hours before they could be randomized or enrolled into the study. So after that, they will then see if the patient met their inclusion criteria. So if you met your, the inclusion criteria, that is the PF ratio was less than 200, and you were ventilated with uh, lung protective strategies, you were included into the study. Right. And then they gave dexamethasone, on the dexamethasone, they gave dexamethasone within 36 hours of enrollment and, uh, and randomization. These were the baseline characteristics because they did enrichment studies. You can see there was not much difference. They were almost perfectly matched. The characteristics that you see or the variables that you see here are the ones that they, 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 they selected when they did their enrichment study. So these characteristics of variables had, a, had increased likelihood of picking up the outcome or the intended outcome and decreasing heterogeneity in the, sele in the selected. Now, this, these are their results, <clears throat> right? What's, what's significant, we just look at ventilator-free days, all right? You see the difference between the group was 4.8%, was, was, was almost 5% confidence <clears throat> intervals. You see um, a significant p-value is significant. I did not do a fragility index here in the Cohen's D. Anyone is, 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 is welcome to do it. 
But from this, you can see that there's benefit uh, from using um, steroids. So the dexamethasone dose they use here, they used 20 milligrams over the first five days. They used it daily because dexamethasone acts for 20 to 48 hours. So they gave dexamethasone daily on all the patients who met the inclusion criteria. And after five days, they tapered the dose to um, half that, which was 10 milligrams for over five days. So this was a 10 day period. So over those 10 day period with tapering of dexamethasone, this is what they found. So the all-cause mortality, the difference was um, more than 15%. <clears throat> and it was significant. <clears throat> so as you can see, everything else, there was a huge difference between those that received dexamethasone and those that did not receive dexamethasone. So now this gave, you know, a new light into, into use of corticosteroids in ICU and as considering their use. They also looked at side effects. As you can see from the side effects, there was no statistical difference if, if they had hyperglycemia or new infection, barotrauma, there was no difference with use of corticosteroids. So again, sort of reducing that fear that we have with use of steroids in ICU. If you look at this kaplan meyer curve, which assesses survival, survival between the two groups, this group would be the dexamethasone group over time, right? And then this will be the control group over time. You see there's, there's better survival with dexamethasone and statistically significant. They even did effect size, which is, I never, I, I don't know if you can do that with kaplan meyer I know with Cox proportional hazard you can, but effect size, you see still, they reported what they reported there as 15%. So for me, this is a, a significant result. This is a positive result, response towards use of, of steroids. But again, you have to look at the results with, 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 with caution because the, the criteria for inclusion was very strict and it might not be applicable in this, in, 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 in our environment. And also, we don't know after the use of corticosteroids whether, you know, what happened to the patients. They, they don't say whether, um, they don't say whether they monitored for adrenocortical suppression or not. So again, you have to take this with, uh, with a pinch of salt. Now, you have to ask yourself, is it safe to use steroids now? We know that in, 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 in COVID or in coronavirus, it may not be completely safe. And we know this because there has been um, a lot of, um, I don't want to say it knows, but there's been a lot of debate regarding steroid use in, um, in, in, in coronavirus. This stemmed from uh, this um, one of, one of, one of, uh, of these observational studies that were done in the Middle East. Some of them were done in, in China. This is one of them. This was uh, published in 2018 in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care. It looked, it was a cohort uh, that uh, looked at four ICUs in the Middle East. Um, these are the baseline characteristics of the patients. If you go through them, they are fairly matched. Um, they are fairly matched. Uh, they even did p values. But if you go straight to the results, the results show that those that received corticosteroids had a high mortality, so 75% compared to 56%. And they, they stayed in, 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 they had high ICU mortality and hospital mortality, and they stayed more in, 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 in ICU and in hospital. There was also increased risk of, um, of, 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 viral replication if you used um, corticosteroids. So they measured this with viral clearance. So if, if you look at this, um, I'll just draw your eye on this 
column here, we'll look at all these numbers, just, just all these numbers. So here, this is a 90-day mortality in the patients that they looked at. They looked at patients that received corticosteroids and those that did not receive corticosteroids. You can see all the confidence intervals on 90-day mortality cross one, all right? And the p-values are not that significant. So they're saying that there's no difference with, uh, in terms of mortality when you use corticosteroids in, in patients that had coronavirus. And then this side looks at coronavirus clearance. You will see, if you look at these values, all of them are almost, uh, well, they, they are all significant, except for this one. Well, this one is significant as well, almost reaching one. So they were trying to say, they are trying to say here, what they are saying here, patients that are on corticosteroids have a low viral clearance. So likelihood of increase of um, viral multiplication. So in their analysis, they looked at low dose and high dose, which they found no difference. They looked at patients that received steroids before seven days and after seven days. They, they said that patients that received steroids before seven days tended to have higher viral multiplication. So of the, of the worst outcomes, those that got, the, got it the worst are those that got steroids within the first seven days of their symptoms or of their being of their enrollment into the study. But again, this is a, an observational study. There are a lot of problems with uh, observational studies that we can discuss later. Then there's, then there's this uh, review or meta-analysis um, that, that was done in 2018, in March 2018, by the Chinese Huan Li. So he was looking at uh, all the studies that looked at coronaviruses, and then he wanted to do a pooled meta-analysis and looked at whether we should be using steroids or not in, in, in this. If you look at this uh, forest plot, you can see, I mean, if you look, look at the summary statistics, it, it's it's on the on the one which says it's it's you know, in terms this is in terms of mortality so it says in terms of mortality there's no difference yeah. right so if they looked at hospital stay they said if you are using steroids you tended to have longer hospital stay this is a meta analysis then if you were on invasive uh, um, ventilation, you tended to, to well, stay longer or they correlated with increased chances of being ventilated. And then uh, viral clearance, they uh, concurred or they agreed with the previous study that you tended to have a lesser viral clearance when you used steroids, especially if they were used within the first seven days. So <laughs> before this, these two studies and some of many studies that were done in influenza viruses influenced how we thought about um, the use of steroids in COVID. It, influences, it influenced the guidelines um, that were um, issued by WHO. It even influenced our own national guidelines that steroids should not be used in COVID. If you look at all guidelines right now, there are a few guidelines that have been, I, I, I haven't seen any in fact, that have been updated to, to show the use of steroids, except for the British guidelines, because Peter Hobie, the, the, the professor who did, who was the lead investigator on this study, um, said that um, they were looking into uh, starting the use of dexamethasone and in, including it in their guidelines in the UK. In, and it has, it has started being used in all NHS hospitals in, in the UK now. So um, <clears throat> I'm doing all this talk as an introduction to this study. So this is uh, the recovery trial, the much talked about recovery trial. 
This is just a preprint that was published on the 22nd of June. It was published in Medical Review. Um, the lead author is Professor Peter Hobie. Uh, <clears throat> they are all from, uh, these, these authors are from Oxford. Okay? If you go into that site, you will, you, you, will, you will be warned, you will find this statement that says, this article is a preprint and, ha and has not been certified, not certified for peer review, by peer review, I mean. It, it reports new medical research that has yet to be evaluated, so should not be used to guide clinical practice. So from this, from here on, um, we will make our own decision as to how we viewed this, this study, but we have to look at the results of this study with a critical eye and be cognizant of, of all the current literature that we have and the worries that we have with steroid use in, 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 in ARDS, pneumonia, or, or critical care. Right, to start off with, so um, <clears throat> they, they, they randomized, well, on the arm that looked specifically, so I'm gonna talk about the arm that looked specifically on dexamethasone. So I'm not gonna talk about the whole start, the recovery trial. I just looked on the arm that dealt with, the, uh, with steroids. So on that part of the trial, they, random, they did a, a two is one randomization where they had twice as much controls compared to, to, to the treatment group. As you can see here, 2,000 and, and 4,000. Uh, you can see from the baseline characteristics, patients were well fairly matched. Um, and you can see that uh, there were a lot of patients that were on oxygen only. Most of patients were on oxygen only. There were some patients, significant number of patients that were on mechanical ventilation. So this allowed analysis of, 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 of results. And you can see that most patients were tested positive. There were some that tested negative, as I can see from the results down here. And some, we say about 28% of the, of, of the patients, the outcome was not known, okay? So regarding the study, uh, all right, let me just go. So what they found was that you gave dexamethasone, right? You had a 21% chance of, of dying. That was their primary outcome. And if you received usual care, that is no dexamethasone, you had a 26%, 24% chance of dying, which was statistically significant. So they did, um, they use an effect size that is called rate ratio. I don't know what is rate ratio. But they use rate ratio. You can see the rate ratio is, 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 is statistically significant, but you can see the confidence interval are almost close to one, but they are small, so um, significant. Okay. Patients that were discharged, also significant results. If you look at patients that received mechanical ventilations, those that uh, did not receive steroids tended to, to, do, to, to, to be on mechanical ventilation more than those that were on steroids. And among those patients that were ventilated, those that received steroids died less than those that did not receive steroid, but this was not significant. So they further on did a what they called a pre-specified subgroup analysis. So now they were only looking at certain groups and, and, and the use of corticosteroids. So they looked at patients that did not receive, that did not receive oxygen. There was no statistical, the results did not favor use of, 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 of steroids. 
But if you were on oxygen only, it favored use of steroid. It favors use of steroid more if you were on um, mechanical ventilation, right? So the, the overall effect uh, result of statistics show that if you were on dexamethasone, you tended to, to, to do much better. Okay. And then they did um, Cox proportional hazard as you to, to come up with those statistics. So Cox proportional hazard compares two groups and sees the effect size between the two groups over time. Right. So you see in all participants, those that received usual care and those that received dexamethasone, those that received usual care tended to die more. They, like you can see here. But if they did not receive oxygen, you see that the curves are crossing. Once the curves cross, the significance of, of the difference of the curve is, is, is debatable, all right? So here you see that at some point, if you gave dexamethasone, you had a higher risk. At some point, if you, and then at some point you had a lower risk. So rather not give in, in these patients. But what we can see here is that, what they believe is that patients that are not on oxygen, are at a period where they have a high viral multiplication. And if you give um, steroids during this time, you will tend to increase the, um, the viral uh, multiplication and maybe the outcomes might not be so beneficial and actually might be worse. If you give, if the patient's oxygen dependent, again, you see there was significant results, but the results were more significant if patients were mechanically ventilated and were needing steroids. Now, this trial was an open label trial. So an open label trial meaning that there was no blinding, right? There was randomization at the, at the beginning. They did block randomization. Um, I think there was concealment of the randomization, but um, the treatment itself was not blinded. Um, the groups, the the prince, the investigators at the at, at, at the different um, um, sites knew about the patients, and the patients knew which group they belonged to. Okay. Uh, secondly. We are not told whether the patients, yeah. Again, they, they, they used a low dose of uh, dexamethasone. They used here, um, they used uh, six milligrams of, of dexamethasone over 10 days, right? So here there was not, there was no tapering. This was just a single dose. In pregnant patients, they say they used methylprednisolone. So methylprednisolone compared to, to dexamethasone is non-fluorinated. So non-fluorinated uh, steroids tend to cause less psychiatric effects than fluorinated uh, steroids, which might be the, one of the reasons why they they, they, they gave methylprednisolone in, in pregnant patients. But um, there's no data here, I don't know, there's no data here on methylprednisolone or pregnant patients. Um, there are a lot of things that, I, that I'm sure the, the panel will want to, 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 to contribute. So the question is, are we there yet? Um, have we found the, the wonder drug? If you analyze the, the data closely, you'd find that um, it's a drug that works sometimes in patients that are really sick. And in medicine, we find that trials that are done in patients that are high risk, we find that the risk of harm between the groups tends to be the same among the groups, and the effect of therapy will tend to be positive anyways, right? So 
is this the drug that we should be using? For me, the take home message to the department would be, um, we should maybe consider using it in moderate to severe ARDS patients, or that meets the Berlin criteria. And we should be sure to use it in, 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 in high risk patients. So patients that we think now are at the cytokine storm level, because we wanna decrease the inflammatory markers we can monitor this by CPR or uh, CRP, um, or um, I forgot the other inflammatory mark. And um, what dose should we, be, should we be using? I think for now, we only have evidence of six milligrams of dexamethasone. We don't know how much uh, methylprednisolone was used. Um, I did not find that information. Um, and we, 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 we have to understand that there are a lot of issues that are unaddressed with the use of steroids in critical care. For example, the, the side effects, the special one being the adenocortical suppression and its effect and its long-term effects, right? And uh, as a result of this now, you find that uh, because this was sensationalized, because there was a huge difference between patients that were ventilated, but the absolute um, uh, difference was around 11%. It was interpreted as a, as a, a, as a relative um, uh, risk reduction, which I think was in the magnitude of 30 or 35%, and it was reported as such. So when it was reported as such, and it was reported in the news, of course, people would think it's a wonder drug that works. So you've had, you've had some people now going to the pharmacy trying to buy dexamethasone to try and prevent and protect themselves from COVID-19. So again, every result <laughs> has to be read in context and has to be fully examined before we, 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 we say um, or we dive into conclusion about anything in fact, in life and in medicine. So that's, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Minister, for the presentation. Yeah, I know we're going to go quick because uh, the, the technical side has already taken us uh, so much time. So, uh, I will open the discussions now, but before that, just in, uh, I wanted to make an announcement. We've been, uh, <clears throat> we, we realized that some of the MOs are, do not attend the morning meetings, especially Luposi, Chaka, and Chomela. I see today Luposi is connected, okay, but Chaka and Chomela are still not uh, coming. I don't know uh, if there's anyone in the in the morning meeting now. Dr. Glovo, can you confirm? Dr. Dr. Kalambi, I'm in theatre with Dr. Glovo. With Dr. Glovo. Dr. Chaka is here, sir. Okay. Chomela. Yes. So I talked to Chumela yesterday. She gave me flimsy excuses, like a uh, technology problem and so on, which I, I don't think we should condone because uh, she had the opportunity to come to the morning meeting if she has a technology problem. Even now, she is the only one who's still redundant. Uh, this uh, behavior has been going on for a long time now. It's, uh, I think, especially in this time of COVID, we need to make sure that people are not taking us for a ride. So, but that's we'll uh, discuss in, in, in a consulted meeting. So I open the discussion for the rest. Prof, do you have anything to, to start with? Hi, Dr. Bambi. I, I first yes. want to say thanks to Dr. Ninise. This was a, a well, um, well prepared presentation. Uh, world class, even the way he's analyzed everything. 
But I am sure that uh, yourself and Tony are going to poke some holes into it, which, I'm, which I appreciate because then we're all going to learn from the process. So then the second one, is I want to comment about what you are saying with Chomela and attendance and everything. I think mm. it's important. Now we are at, at the time of PMDS. People should really honestly examine themselves as to whether they really want to be with us and to learn anesthetics. For example, I, I didn't have any electricity. Even now my phone is flat because there was no electricity the whole night. So I woke up without access to a phone, but I made means. I went and got my laptop, which was at least charged, and my dongle. And I emailed uh, Dr. Sabona, Dr. Androvu, and Dr. Sukwana, and one of them responded to give me the, the, the meeting ID, which for me, I'm just telling the story to show that if you really want to listen, because hmm. it's really easier to listen from home because you are at the comfort of your own home. You are drinking your coffee and, you know, but you are learning. So if you, if you are failing to even attend this meeting, then it means you are really not interested and you should look into yourself because nobody is forcing you to be in the department. You could go and be in dermatology if that's what you prefer. So I'm saying let's be serious about this and people should introspect about what they want uh, in their careers. Then going back to Dr. Ninisa's presentation, mm. I want to ask Dr. Ninisa, all these people are using different steroids. There's methylprednisolone, there's dexamethasone, there's hydrocortisone. So the first question is, is there any, can you work out any differences in terms of the effect of the steroid or the type of steroid and why there is a, such a difference or similarity across the studies? People are using different steroids. Can one effect be transferred, one effect of one steroid be transferred to another steroid? And then secondly, um, this is one st the study that you showed is one study, but I saw that you compared with the meta-analysis by Medjuri from 2018. What is your comment with regards to the fact that the pathophysiology of um, uh, COVID, ARDS, is not the same as what, what we know from 2018? And also here we are seeing a lot of patients dying from cardiac complications rather than from a respiratory failure. And then also comment about the long-term effects because the patients are old, the patients are fat, uh, people are following them up, maybe up to 30 days. What would be the impact on frailty uh, considering that these, these drugs have a side effect of avascular necrosis? So those are things that would count for a person who is frail and old. And this hyperglycemia story pushing them into, if they were metabolic syndrome without diabetes, maybe they'll go into diabetes. But I think there's a lot of uh, long-term effects that are not really reported on. And one of the issues with steroids in ICU, like especially with, with, um, with shock, is that there is reversal of the shock, but they find that the patients don't do well still because they get the side effects of myopathy and all of that, and some don't get out of ICU. So you get a reversal of the pathology you are treating them for at that time, but it doesn't translate into a long-term effect. Thank you, Dr. Ninis. I must thank you, Prof, for that uh, well-rounded comment. And uh, thank you for the compliment as well. Um, the questions are tough indeed. Um, the first question um, is uh, on use of steroid or the different types of steroids across the studies and whether different types of steroids have impact on outcomes, if I understood you correctly. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, like I, I've been, what I've found, Prof, was that different studies, within the studies themselves, right, they would use the term corticosteroids, right? Mm -hmm. The term corticosteroids will then be used to mean different types of corticosteroids, <laughs> like 
hydrocortisone, um, uh, methylprednisolone, and um, dexamethasone, which, which I saw were the most common that were being used in critical care. Now, I did not find any study that compared the different glucocorticoids themselves in terms of effect. But what I found was studies tended to convert, they uh, used the formula that I showed in the beginning, well, the table that I showed in the beginning, to convert the effect of steroids and, and, and sort of use the one for the other. For example, in this, in, in, in this, um, in, the, in the study, the, what's, what's the study that we have right The recovery now? trial. The recovery trial. They used dexamethasone and methylprednisolone, and there's no report on methylprednisolone. Like, I, don't, I did not find one. So again, I don't have an answer for, the, for that question, Prof. I, I have the same questions as you. Then the next question was, is the effect of steroid in these two types of patients since we know that ARDS is a syndrome that is caused by different things, and that we are saying that in the study that I, 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 I quoted the meta-analysis that Meduri analyzed, um, that most patients, they, well, some patients, they had cardiac illnesses and all of that. Actually, if you, if, 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 if you would um, read the prof. Most of the patients they, 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 they used there were patients that had pneumonia or patients that had sepsis. So they mm -hmm. were saying that steroids were most likely to, 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 to help in patients that had an inflammatory cause of ARDS rather than a non-inflammatory cause. Like mm -hmm. if you had heart problems, um, you were less likely to benefit from steroids. So they tended to attribute all of that effect to those types of patients because the number of, of patients they have in that analysis, 5% had either pneumonia or sepsis. So I don't know if that still answers the question. That's as much as I can answer that, that question. Yeah. It's, thank you, I, I appreciate that. And, I, and there's a third question as well. Yes, the third question. <laughs> the third question and then the fourth. Yes, there, it's about the fact that it's a, it was a comment actually about the fact that they report they report mainly so twenty eight days or thirty days is relatively short oh. term for oh, the yes yes that is that is that is true prof that is very true that's a that's a serious concern that I also had with these studies when I looked at them all of them mm. whether they report bad outcomes or good outcomes in the in, in, in overall they never then tell you about um uh, long-term effects like the serious one like i mentioned being adrenocortical suppression so you, mm. you don't know anything there's no study that i found that looked mainly on 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 on, on side effects so the studies that i, I managed to find the studies that were looking primarily either mechanical ventilation or mortality, and then as secondary outcomes would look maybe on side effects. Mm -hmm. And most of them commented that the side effects were not significant, but if you, you see that the studies were not powered to look for, for side effects. So that still raises the question of use of steroids in the critical care period mm -hmm. in these patients. So it's, a, it's a still a serious concern as well. Mm -hmm. so that, yeah, that's that's how I can answer that that question, Prof. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, other colleagues, any? Uh, May I talk about question? me? Question? Yes, yes. Uh, Imad. Okay. Uh, thanks, Nino, for the for presentation. I can see that you had you done a lot of work on it. Nice literature review, and that makes that makes me ask you. When are you going come, coming to the IC rotation? <laughs> uh, I don't have uh, questions, but just two comments. I'm in favor of using steroids. But the thing that my concern is the I've seen the recovery trial that the, the rate of secondary infection was 24%. I expect that to be higher in our setting. And the issue that, as far as I know, we don't have the calcitonin as a biomarker in uh, our lab. 
So I hope that we can have uh, the calcitonin soon. So it will show you show us the bacterial secondary infection, and so we decide whether we continue or stop the steroid. Are you saying about oh, PCP? We do have calcitonin. We we Pro do have. Yes. We I asked have. for it. Okay, okay, that's good. Or maybe you said calcitonin. You didn't say PCT. <laughs> The PCT, ah, yeah, yes, maybe, maybe that's the issue. Okay, yeah. okay, that, that, that will help us a lot to uh, investigate for the secondary infection. Uh, last, mm. last thing that you, I, I'm happy that you raised up the thing of uh, the, the public start to buy dexamethasone and thinking that it will protect them. We had a patient in, in Durban before I come who, was, who, who, who had autoimmune. He was in uh, chloroquine and he came to to ICU and mechanic ventilation because he couldn't find his medication anymore because it was out of stock from the uh, for public from the hospitals and from the pharmacy because the public started to buy it a lot thinking that it's a treatment. As far as I remember, there is some study before that the use of uh, steroid as prophylaxis to ERDS showed increase in the complications and mortality. So I hope I hope that we we separate the world for the public that we shouldn't use the exemptazone as a prophylaxis. Okay, thank you.